seated. Well, let me encourage you to pull out your message outline uh, as we're in this uh, fourth part of this series uh, that we've been in for the last couple of weeks. Uh, this series called No Superheroes Required. We're looking at how God uses ordinary people in extraordinary ways. And uh, we've already looked at uh, three, uh, three characters, three names that have all, are listed in Hebrews 11, which is like God's Hall of Fame, or you could call it God's Hall of Faith, actually. And uh, so this morning we're going to be looking at uh, Abraham. Now I wonder, have you ever had one of those sorts of nights? You know, one of those nights where there are a thousand different things rushing through your head. Or a burden weighing on your heart, a heavy burden, and it felt like all you could do was just toss and turn the night away and rest, real sleep, just, well, it felt impossible. We, we live in a restless culture, don't we? We are busy, we are overcommitted, we are overworked, and very often we are overstressed. We have more material possessions and wealth than almost any society in history, and then with that also comes the incomparable level of tension and stress and worry. In fact, research tells us that one in four of the adult population in the UK today suffers from some sort of clinical anxiety disorder. And that doesn't even include the sort of day-to-day -day worrying that most of us experience every single day of our lives. Some of you walked into this room this morning with something on your mind that you simply just cannot shift. You can't shake loose. Something on your heart that you simply cannot just move out. Maybe you're thinking about it even now as I'm speaking. A problem at work, perhaps, or an unresolved conflict in your life. Maybe a health or illness issue. Maybe it's a friend or family member who are in a crisis. Maybe it is a relationship problem. Maybe it's a stack of bills that just keep piling higher and higher, and you feel like you're sinking deeper and deeper. And what happens is, is that our hearts slip into this state of this perpetual tossing and turning, making for long nights and then therefore very tiresome days. And yet we work hard at finding ways to find rest and peace, and particularly on those sleepless nights. So you can buy various things that might help you. You can buy things like um, uh, pressure point reducing mattresses so that you might have a lovely restful sleep. There are these white noise sound machines that you can place in your bedroom to sort of drive out all the other noises. There are prescription medicines that will put you to sleep. We work so hard to find rest and peace, which is a funny paradox really, isn't it? But the truth of the matter is, is that only God has the answer to the restlessness that we very often feel. Jesus put it this way in Matthew 11, 28 to 30. He said, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Now, I'm guessing many of you have heard those words before, maybe on numerous occasions, and you might be sitting there thinking this morning, well, you know what, I've done that. I've heard that one before. Sounds really good in theory, like the sound of it, but this is real life. That's unrealistic. If you knew my life at the moment, if you knew what was going on at the moment, well, that's just, that's just unrealistic. But why is it when we hear these words, so many of us still live with this nagging anxiety and tension and stress and fear? Because according to Jesus, this isn't, this isn't just a possibility, this is a promise. And the promises of Jesus and the promises of God are cast iron guarantees. You shall find rest for your soul, says Jesus. And not only that, Jesus says, my yoke is easy, my burden is light. In other words, when we are serving Jesus, when we are using our talents for his glory, then life is just, it's better, because we are, we are living our lives in the plans and purposes of God. And the burdens that Christ gives to us are easy, they are light. They are things that we long for, actually. And really, that's what we're thinking about in this series, No Superheroes Required, because what we're doing, as we've done over the last three weeks, and again this morning, we're looking at some of the people that are listed in Hebrews 11. And what we've seen is that these were just ordinary people like you and I, 
They weren't superstar Christians or anything like that. They were just ordinary people, and yet God did some extraordinary things through them. They weren't perfect. They often failed. They often screwed up. They made mistakes. But they actually all lived an effective life for God. And if you are a Christian, be honest with yourself. Deep down, that's what you really want. You want to live an effective life for God. But the problem is, is that we can fall into this trap of, of holding back, not getting involved in what God wants us to do, and um, what he wants to do through us. We hold back because we say, well, life is just too busy at the moment. Or, or we don't feel that we are good enough. We compare ourselves to other people, and we say, well, they're involved in that ministry. There's no way I can be involved in that because I wouldn't be as good as them. Or we say, where I am at the moment, emotionally, where I feel in my life and the things that's going on at the moment... I just don't have time to do that. I just don't feel ready or able to do these sorts of things. Or actually, we are just simply fearful. In fact, more than that, we get fearful about the future. We're fearful about what might God ask us to do. And therefore, then, that paralyzes us, and we don't accept God's plan for our life and our ministries that, and the service that he wants us involved with. See, let's be honest, each of us, if we really stop and think about it, each of us kind of have in our mind the kind of future that we, w that we long for. We have certain things that we think, oh, I'd, I'd love to see that happen. Maybe we've been working for it for all of our lives. Maybe we've been just beginning in our early stages of our life, and we, 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 well, this is the future that I would like. This is the idea that I have in my mind. This is what I'd like to see happening. This is the sort of thing that I want. This is the house I'd like to live in. Um, this is the sort of relationships that I would like to have. Uh, I'd like to have some sort of hope for financial security. Uh, we hope for love and relationships. We, we hope for a family if we haven't got one. We hope for a career or a certain level of importance and significance in our lives. And we, we paint this prefer, preferred future that we would like, this picture of our future. But we live with this nagging tension, this nagging fear that maybe these things are disappearing. And actually, the older we are, the longer we live, the, the future that we maybe thought about 20 years ago seems to be disappearing. It's not what we thought. This is not where we thought we would be. We thought our life would be different by now. And actually, if we attain some level of what we think our future might be, then we worry that we're going to lose it. Because if we have it, what if we lose it? Ever feel like all the stuff that you're so desperate to have is also all the stuff that you're so consistently worried about? Bit of a funny paradox again, isn't it? Well, if so, you're not alone. And therefore, you need a renewed vision of God and how God thinks about our picture of the future. How God can use ordinary you and me in his plans and purposes. Because when you discover what that is, life gets easier. Why? Well, because we're living the type of life that God wants us to live. We are living out his own plans and purposes for our lives. We are moving to the future that he wants for our life, not what we want. And life just gets a little bit easier. Yeah, there are problems. Yeah, there are challenges. But life gets easier because you know you're in the plans and purposes of God. And to help us to understand this, we're going to look at Abraham, listed in Hebrews 11, who struggled with some of the things that we struggle with. Because Abraham, like you, was working on his own picture of his future. Abraham had a career, you see. He was educated. He had a family. In fact, he accrued material wealth. He was probably thinking to himself about how to provide for his own retirement. You know, he was an older guy. How is he going to provide for his retirement, for his family, and so on? He was probably managing a number of different tasks, a number of issues of life, as it were. And I can imagine for Abraham, there were a few restless nights as he wondered about where his life was going, if his future would be secure, if he'd be able to keep a track of all that was in this picture of, of his future. And perhaps it was during one of these sleepless nights when God, in fact, interrupted Abraham's life with these incredible words. God said to Abraham, as we, we know him as Abraham, that he says this in Genesis 12, verses 1 to 4, the Lord had said to Abraham, leave your country, your people, and your father's household, and go to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you I will curse, and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So Abraham left, as the Lord had told him, and Lot with him, 
Abraham was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. So what do we make of a story like this? Well, the two observations I want you to see this morning that I think will help us all. Follow on, on your outline. The first is this. We don't need to fear the future because God is watching over me. There is a danger that we begin to fear the future because our preferred future may not be working out as we thought it might be. And therefore, the first and most important observation is the picture of God in this story of Abraham. God is watching over me. In the midst of life filled with uncertainty and with this call on his life that is going to bring more uncertainty on Abraham, God gives Abraham two words to live by. And they, they are these. God says, I will. In fact, seven times God says in some way or another, I will. Seven times God says, I will do whatever it takes to get you where you need to go. I will. Now, just think what that phrase is and what that phrase isn't. God doesn't say, I might. God doesn't say, I can't. God doesn't say, well, I'll try my best. God doesn't say, well, I'll think about it. God doesn't say, you will. God doesn't doesn't say, you have to. God doesn't say, it's only up to you. God defines himself by a promise and he says, I will. Now remember this is God, this is not a flawed person, this is not someone who gets busy and forgets, this is not someone like us who makes a promise and then forgets all about it or then doesn't come good on it. This is not an organisation that runs out of resources, this is the God of the universe who comes to Abraham and he says, I will. So here's a question for you this morning, whose hands are you actually in? In other words, who are you trusting for your future? Who holds your future? You, your spouse, your parents, your children, your retirement plan, your financial advisor, your insurance company? The truth is there is only one true source of insurance, one true source of assurance, one true source of safety and security in this entire universe, and that is the God who interrupts our world interrupts our lives with two important words, I will. Now here's how that impacted Abraham, Hebrews 11 verse 8. By faith, Abraham, when he was called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed, and went even though he did not know where he was going. Now God asked Abraham here to make some major changes in his life, to pack up everything and go. The only thing is, God didn't tell him where he was moving to. He just said, you're going. Get moving. Now, I don't know about you, but I wouldn't be too keen on that. I like to know where I'm going. Do you? I mean, I can imagine Abraham a lot of questions. Um, uh, Right, okay, well, where are we going, Lord? Uh, The Lord said, well, I'll let you know. Well, okay, um, how long will it take, Lord? Um, I'll let you know. Well, how do I know when I get there? Well, I'll let you know. Would you move on that basis? Would you turn your world upside down on that basis? And it's especially difficult for Abraham for several reasons. Because in Genesis, in the verses we read, it tells us that Abraham, when he moved, was 75 years old. How many of you who are in that sort of ballpark area would like to move somewhere where you have no idea where you're going? At 75. See, Abraham was saying, God, I'm ready to retire. I'm ready for my pension. I'm ready to kick back and relax. I'm ready to sit in my easy chair. Some of you are retired going, well, that's not what we're having at the moment. Um, But, you know, he was ready just to take it easy. And God says, hey, it's not my plan for you. Hey, you're going to have the biggest adventure of your life. He was old. Not only that, he was wealthy. Abraham lived in a city called Ur. Now, that doesn't sound too appealing to us, does it? A place called Ur. I mean, no wonder he wanted to leave Ur. But, uh, you know, that's where he lived. Um, Archaeologists tell us that actually Ur was a beautiful city of the time. So really, it was the place where all the wealth of the world was centred. So so Abraham was a fat cat in Ur. He had loads of money. He was wealthy. He had it made. He had sheep, he had cattle, he had at least 50 servants. He'd accumulated a lot. And, And a major move with all his family and relatives and sheep and cattle, that's a lot of work, isn't it? And on top of that, God has not told him where he was going. But as it says here, Abraham moved immediately even though he didn't know where he was going. He left immediately without excuse. 
Now remember, Abraham didn't ask for this. Abraham wasn't praying, Lord, I'd like to move somewhere where I have no idea where I'm going. He wasn't praying that. Abraham was minding his own business. God interrupts his life and says, from now on, your life is safe and secure in my hands and I will get you where you need to go. And if we take this seriously, we have absolutely nothing to fear. See, we are living, I think at the moment, our country is a fearful country. And you can understand why, with the terrorist attacks, the awful fire that took place this week in the Grenfell Tower, people are fearful. They are fearful of the future. They are fearful of the unknown. And they are running around blaming other people and running around almost like headless chickens trying to solve it. And yet, they can't. Because you can't. One of the most common commands in the Bible is this, do not be afraid. Time and time again, God says to us, do not be afraid. There is no reason for us to fear because we have a God who says, I will. And those of you maybe who are facing discouragement or heartache at the moment, God says, I will give you the strength when you need it. Not when you think you need it, but when I think you need it. At those moments when you're, at the, you're on the ropes, then I'll give you the strength. For those of you facing sickness or health issues, God says, I will supply, I will bring you hope, I will provide for you. For those of you facing financial distress, God says, I will provide as you need. Not what you want, but as you need it. For those of you who are saying, God couldn't use someone like me. God says, actually, I've given you gifts and talents to use in my service and for my glory, and I will help you discover them, I will help you use them, and I will actually equip you to serve. If you're willing to trust a God who says, I will, nothing that is of eternal value in life is in any way at risk. You have nothing to fear, in other words, because you are in good hands. You are in the hands of a God who makes sure promises and provides a sure foundation. So Hebrews 11, verse 9, we read, By faith Abraham made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. Now there's an important word here in verse 9, and it's used twice. It is the word promise. Promise is an important word in the vocabulary of a true believer. Why? Because God wants us to base our lives on promises, not on expectations on explanation, but on expectation. We want explanations, don't we? We want God to explain everything that's going on in our lives. God, I'll do this if you tell me everything that's going to happen. If you tell me all the details, then I'll do this. I'll trust you in this. We want explanations of why things happen, good or bad things in our lives. Our country is asking the question, why do these things happen? But that's not what God wants us to base our lives on, his explanation. He wants us to base our lives on his promises. God promised Abraham, if you move, I will give you the land of Israel. Now the problem is, is after he got there, there was a delay in the transfer of ownership. Abraham lived another hundred more years, and he never did receive it at that point. And notice it says he lived in tents. Well, that is really talking about temporary living. How would you like to live in a tent for a hundred years? He's not settled down. He was constantly on the move. It's partly his lifestyle, but he was constantly moving. How long did he have to wait? Well, it also says, so did Isaac and Jacob. That is two more generations. So Abraham had to wait three generations to get the promise fulfilled. Now, that is a long time to wait, isn't it? Abraham probably started every prayer with, when, Lord? When's this going to happen? And at times, God will test us to strengthen our faith. Sometimes you will face life, in life, a delayed promise from God. Now, that's not God messing with us. That's not God playing games with us. God isn't some sort of devious puppet master playing games and seeing how long it takes for you to crack up. No, no, no. It is actually for our good. When we're in those periods of waiting, it's when God tests our faith. And he uses those times to strengthen our faith. When am I going to get it? God, when are you going to answer? When are you going to fulfill your promises? When will you answer that prayer? When will you do this, Lord? 
Now, I don't know about you, but I can handle tests if I know that there's a time limit to them and that they will end eventually, but it's much more difficult to handle the kind of test where there doesn't seem to be any end in sight. It seems to just go on and on and on, and you're praying and you're praying, and it just doesn't seem to be any end in sight. It doesn't get any better, so, so that marriage problem doesn't get any better. In fact, it might even get worse. The job situation doesn't get better. It grinds you down, it's hard, it's difficult. It seems like there is no end in sight. There seems to be this continual test, a delayed promise. Now, you know it's going to come because that God promises these things, but you don't know when. So a real believer waits on God's timing because he knows it is perfect, even though he doesn't know when it's going to happen. So James describes God in this way, James 1.17, as one with whom there is never the slightest variation or shadow of inconsistency. Isn't that an encouraging verse? That's the God we worship. Our moods may shift, but God doesn't. Our minds may change, but God is the unchangeable one. Our devotion to him may falter, but God never does. Even if we are faithless, he is always faithful. For he cannot deny himself. He is a sure God. He is the God who watches over you. Secondly, we don't need to fear the future because God walks with me. Now, as good as this sounds, and it is good news, there is a catch. There is one line of fine print. God says, you have to trust me. God says to Abraham, you now have to trust me with all the details of that picture of your future that you hold on to so tightly. And guess what? This trust is going to feel risky because there are a lot of unknowns. There are a lot of uncertainties. There are a lot of twists and turns. There are a lot of paths that we're called to take where we do not see how things are going to turn out. See, look back at what God calls Abraham to do. Remember, we know the story, and the danger with that is, is we think, well, it's all right for Abraham because he knows what's coming. No, he doesn't. We do because we know the end. He didn't. Not at this point. So God says to Abraham, go. Abraham says, where? God says, to the land I will show you. Abraham says, well, where is that then? God says, you'll have to wait and see. Wait and see? Wait and see? God, this is my life we're talking about here. Wait and see? Now, that kind of faith is risky, isn't it? It's difficult. And if you keep reading the story of Abraham, you find that when Abraham finally gets to this land that God shows him, there are Canaanites living there, a.k.a. there ain't no vacancy. And so he has to keep moving. And he ends up in the wilderness in the middle of nowhere. And the Bible says he's calling on the name of the Lord because he wants to know, Lord, what's going on? And then there's this great famine in the land. And he ends up in Egypt, a.k.a. I gave up everything for this God and all I got was this lousy T-shirt. See, that's what Abraham's feeling here. I risked it all, Lord. Here was my picture of the future. That's what I was working for. You've come in, totally turned my world upside down. And now... The future that I thought was safe and secure in my hands, now what do I have? Life did not turn out the way Abraham expected. And you probably can echo those words. Life, as you know, probably for you, has not turned out the way you expected. And the longer you live, the more you realize that, perhaps. When you're younger, great dreams, here's what I want, bring it on, Lord. And yet, mistakes bring consequences, and we have to live with those consequences, and some of those consequences go with us into our future, not the preferred future that we had in our mind. And so we can resonate with these things, can't we? And in, and in fact, much of what Abraham had, much that gave him this sense of security and confidence, much of what allowed him to feel comfortable and content, God says, you've got to leave all that stuff behind. You need to trust me. So stop clinging to all that with all your might, with a closed hand. Instead, you need to trust me with it. And we all face situations in life where we have to choose whether or not we're going to do that, whether we're going to follow what we think is our future, which is not the best, or we follow God's future, which is always better. You see, trust is a choice. We choose to trust. Now, that's easy to say when life is ticking over okay, isn't it? You know, when we're on the mountaintop, when life is just wonderful, everything is as it should be, we go, yeah, of course we can trust God's piece of cake, isn't it? Yeah, we trust God, life is great, singing praises, bring it on, Lord, whatever you want, great. 
But when life takes that unexpected turn, it's not so easy, is it? For example, someone is battling serious health issues and in the midst of questions about treatment and future health, there are the deeper questions about the picture of life that they have and if it is now deteriorating away, disappearing before their eyes because they thought life was going to look like this, but now this health issue means life is going to look like that. That's not what I was looking for. Trusting God at that point is no longer this nice spiritual idea. Trusting God is a gut-wrenching, heartbreaking, nerve-wracking affair because everything that matters to their life now feels in some way at risk. God, that's not what I thought was going to happen. Now, God will be faithful to you. God will walk with you every step of the way and you can find peace with that without any strings attached. And what a blessing it is to know that, to discover that, to live in that daily. And what peace and freedom that brings. And yet so few of us with so much actually ever really know this and experience it. The reality is this kind of faith, this kind of trust is really, really difficult. And most of us can't handle the waiting, the uncertainty, the, the, the what-ifs of life. So we start to go out and we look at ways in which we can fill in the blanks. What we do is we say, God, I'm sure you've got this covered, but just in case, we make a way of sort of trying to compensate for God, don't we? If he doesn't come through, we'll just fill in God's promises. If they don't come through in the way in which we hope for, we'll just, yeah, we'll just pick up the slack, God, for you. Which is exactly what Abraham did, actually. This is a fascinating moment. Look back at Genesis 12, verse 4. So Abraham, Abraham left as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Notice that? Lot went with him. Didn't God say, leave your family and your father's household behind? But Abraham takes his nephew. Why? Well, we see God's promise of making Abraham a great nation meant that Abraham would need a child. But here's the thing. Abraham is already 75 years old. Fancy having a child at 75 years old? Thanks, but no thanks. Oh, enough for the grandchildren. At least you can give them back, can't you? Yeah, you know what I'm saying, some of you. And of course, his wife was also a, a lot older as well. She was old and she was unable to have children as well. So Abraham, what he does is he fills in the gaps with things when things look impossible, where it seems like God might not come through. And he takes his nephew so they will have a family line. He takes his nephew in case they need a child of promise. Abraham, you see, is basically saying, look, God, I know, I know, I know you promised to take care of me, and it all sounds really great. It does, Lord. But, you know, things here on earth, things in my life, they don't look so promising. The circumstances don't look that great. Um, I'll sleep a lot better, Lord, if, if, if I just deal with this child of promise thing. You know, I'll pick up the slack a little bit. Let me deal with it in my own way, in my own time, as I see fit. And, of course, if you, if you know the story, every time Lot shows up, there just seems to be another problem. Lot takes the land God promised to Abraham. Lot gets himself in trouble in Sodom and Gomorrah because Lot wasn't supposed to be there. Lot is not the child of promise. Isaac will be, but they couldn't see it. They couldn't wait for it. They couldn't handle the uncertainty. They couldn't handle the what if God. They couldn't handle the question, what if God doesn't come through in this? In fact, Abraham continued to struggle with this. Even though God had promised him that he would be the father of a great nation, Hebrews 11, 11 to 12, by faith, Abraham, even though he was past age and Sarah herself was barren, was enabled to become a father because he considered him faithful who had made the promise. And so from this one man, and he is good as dead, some came descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as countless as the sand on the seashore. See, God had promised Abraham that, <coughs> that one day, he would be the father of a great nation, the nation of Israel. But here's the problem. Abraham's now 99 years old. And he still didn't have any kids. Would you be a bit worried at that? I mean, that's proper old, isn't it? 99. Imagine planning your first children at age 99. Wow. And Sarah's pretty old in years as well. She's already gone through the menopause. She's incapable of having children. Abram looks at himself and goes, no way. Sarah looks at herself and goes, <laughs> double no way. <laughs> I'm not having any of that nonsense, thanks very much. It's an impossible situation. 
Well, here it is in Genesis 18. God sent a couple of messengers to talk to Abraham and his wife and to tell them that the promise that he had promised them would be fulfilled, that this impossible situation was going to be turned into a miracle. Here it is, Genesis 18. Where is your wife Sarah, they asked him. There in the tent, he said. Then the Lord said, I will surely return to you about this time next year, and Sarah, your wife, will have a son. Now, Sarah was listening at the entrance to the tent, which was behind him. Abraham and Sarah were already old and well advanced in years, and Sarah was past the age of childbearing. So Sarah laughed to herself as she thought, after I'm worn out and my master is old, will I now have this pleasure? She's saying, oh, no way, thanks very much. I mean, she says, I'm worn out, my master is old, it's not going to happen. Verse 13, then the Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh and say, will I really have a child now that I am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? I will return to you at the appointed time next year and Sarah will have a son. Sarah was afraid, so she lied and said, I did not laugh. But he said, yes, you did laugh. Now, we know, we know that Sarah did not believe that she would have a baby because a woman of her age, if she really thought, if she really thought she was going to have a baby, she would not have laughed. She would have cried her eyes out, wouldn't she? See, ladies going, yes, you preach it, preacher, this morning, I know. So she didn't believe this whatsoever. And the fact of the story was, is it was an impossible situation. Abraham laughed, Sarah laughed, but here's the thing, God had the last laugh because Isaac was born. And they named him Isaac, which means laughter. They said, this is impossible. They laughed at the idea, but God had the last laugh. They couldn't handle the what ifs. They couldn't handle the question, what if God doesn't come through? And we say the same things again and again and again, don't we? How am I supposed to be generous with my resources when I feel so cash-strapped? What if God doesn't come through? How am I supposed to be freely given my time when I don't feel I have enough time to do anything? What if God doesn't come through? It's hard to live with that uncertainty, isn't it? It's hard to live our lives with the what if. Let me pause for a moment and ask you that question. What, what does that question hit home for you right now? What if God doesn't come through? What does that mean in your life today? What is that heavy burden that you carry that keeps you awake at night? What is the anxiety that is deep down, deep inside your heart, maybe right to your bones? What makes you chase God's promises in your own way? Saying, no, I'm not sure you're going to come through, God, so I'll just do this to help. Where are you afraid that God won't come through for you? The truth is, there is no lasting peace or joy and contentment in this life without Jesus at the very centre of our lives. And if you've tried any other tactic than Jesus Christ, then you know the, the restlessness that I was talking about earlier on. If you try to live your life without Christ, do not expect peace and joy and contentment. You'll get a level of happiness, but not the sort of joy and contentment that, that the Bible describes. Because you're living your life apart from Christ. You're living your life away from what God wants. But you see, it doesn't have to be that way. It can be different. You can be different. All it takes a moment where you say, as Abraham did, is you relinquish your grip over that life, that, that picture of your future that you hold so tightly, saying, Lord, this is what I'm having, whether you like this or not, where you say, no, actually, I'll open my hand, and Jesus, I will trust you with that future. And actually, now, Lord, it doesn't really look the way that I thought it was going to be. That future doesn't look so sure, or the one that I had in my mind. Jesus, I will mean it will... I will trust you. Even if it means risking all the stuff that I think is valuable, all the things that I think are important, I will risk that because I will trust you. And you know, God may already be putting something on your heart. In fact, you know maybe that God has been speaking to you maybe over a period of weeks, months, maybe even years. And you know you need to deal with that. Or something that you need to let go of something that you're holding on to so tightly that you know is messing up the future plans he has for you. And actually it's affecting the present, not just the future. What do you need to let go of and hold with an open hand? Now as I close, let me give you a few practical ways to do this sort of stuff because I don't know about you, um, 
I need some practical things to help me understand this sort of trusting God thing, what it actually looks like on a daily basis. What, what, what does it mean? How, how do I do this daily? How do I do this as I go about my week? Let me give you four suggestions. First of all, the first one would be this. Start listening for God to speak to you. Start listening for God to speak to you in the here and now. At the very core of Christian spirituality is a God who speaks. Abraham's life began to change because God spoke to him and he was listening. And the same can be true for you today, this week. See, we serve a God who has life-changing words for us all at every time, every single day uh, of our lives. The problem is, when it comes time to pray, what we tend to do is we tend to do all the talking. We tend to have a lot, of say, a lot to say, don't we, when we start praying. We just sort of rattle it off, almost like a machine gun, say in Jesus' name, amen, and carry on with our day. We don't stop and listen. We don't have a place to say, just for a moment, God, you know, uh, let's start fresh. Um, uh, there's a lot of stuff I want to talk to you about today, but actually I need to listen to what you have to say to me because that's far more important. Could you take five minutes, ten minutes, fifteen minutes a day to do this, to stop and listen? See, Abraham did, and it changed his life forever. Psalm 46, verse 10 says, Be still and know that I am God. Some of the other translations of that verse said, Cease striving, stand through it, let go of your concerns, and you will know that I am God. And we hear that and go, Be still, come on, get serious, Phil. In today's busy lifestyles, you have no idea what type of week I've got coming up. The fast-paced, frantic lifestyle that I live in, just to survive that on a daily basis. And you're saying to me, to stop, to be still... You've got to be kidding. But that's what God says to us. He says, be still and know that I am God. See, prayer is not some duty that we have to do. It is a privilege that we get to do. You get to talk to the creator of the universe and he invites you and he wants to talk with you. He wants you to listen. And we live in such a noisy world, don't we? Could you sit for five minutes in complete silence? You try it, I bet you're fine. You start looking at your watch two and a half minutes in, if not before. I think they did some surveys on this, that most people last 30, 40 seconds before they actually start getting jumpy. They say to them, how long do you think you've been sitting in silence? And they only say, they think it's five minutes when actually it's only a couple. It's difficult, but that's what we're called to do. Be still and know that I am God. We have a God who speaks, so we need to take the time to listen. Second thing. We look to, for ways to serve God in the present. See, the God who says, oh, I will make sure you get where you need to go, he also says, on the way, you need to pay more attention to the present moment, to today, and start serving me in it. See, what we do, the danger is to go, well, when we've just got this sorted, I'll do this, and I just want to make sure that everything is as it should be in my life, and then I serve. Well, that's not what Jesus says. Jesus puts it this way in Matthew 6, 31, 32. He says, so do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows what you, that you need them. Now, notice it doesn't say, your heavenly Father doesn't really care about all that sort of stuff, because he really does. The Father knows what you need. He knows you need these things. Food and clothing and so on and drink. But then it says, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. Seek first the kingdom. The key word is first, not second, not just on a Sunday, not just at church. First means first every day. That means we need to be diligent about finding a place to serve and to bless others and do it now. Instead of just planning out tomorrow. James 4.17 says, anyone then who knows the good he ought to do and doesn't do it, sins. And James is talking about the issue of procrastination. Here's a little rhyme that goes like this. Procrastination is my sin. It only calls me sorrow. I know I ought to change my ways. In fact, I will tomorrow. And we love to put things off, don't we? We love to procrastinate. Just because you know the right thing to do doesn't mean you're going to do it. And procrastination is this subtle trap. It's the land of, well, one day I'll do this. Tomorrow I'll do this, and tomorrow comes and you never do it. Oh, well, I'll tell you what, I'll do it next week. Next week comes and you never do it. Oh, I'll do it next month and next, you know. And what we do is we presume upon tomorrow. One of these days I'm going to get serious about God. One of these days I'm going to get really committed. One of these days I'm going to serve. And God says, you do not have the guarantee of tomorrow. The solution is do it now. 
Look at Proverbs 3, 27, 28. Do not withhold good from those who deserve it when it is in your power to act. Do not say to your neighbor, come back later, I'll give it tomorrow, when you now have it with you. In other words, if someone asks you to do them a favor, don't say, oh, well, I'll do that tomorrow, later. No, do it now. Don't procrastinate. Whatever you intend to do for the Lord, do it now. Not next week, not next month, not next year. So, thinking about witnessing to a friend and inviting them to the church, do it now. Thinking about joining a small group, do it now. Thinking about getting involved in the ministry and serving, do it now. Thinking about starting to tithe and give, do it now. Find a place to serve and bless others in the present, do it now. Thirdly, we have to live a life with God one day at a time. Because life is unpredictable. None of us know what is going to happen tonight, much less next year. None of us know what is going to happen in our life because we cannot presume on tomorrow. Now, I think we've seen that very clearly with the awful disaster that took place in that fire in the Grenfell Tower. Many of those people, if not all of those people, went to bed expecting to wake up the next day. And many are, are dead now. You and I, we cannot presume on tomorrow. James 4.14 says, Why? You do not even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Life is brief. You are a mist. Mist in the Greek is the Greek word atmos, where we get the word atmosphere. Your life is like a fog. It rolls in in the morning, but it burns off by noon. Who knows how long we're going to live? None of us do. The Bible describes our lives in these ways as using phrases like a leaf and grass and shadow and cloud and puff of smoke and vapour. Listen, you and I, we're only one heartbeat away from eternity. I don't know how long I'm going to live, and neither do you, but the reality is life is short. Well, what's the solution? Well, Matthew 6, 34, Jesus says, so don't be anxious about tomorrow. God will take care of your tomorrow too. Live one day at a time. That's how God says you face the future. Live one day at a time. The future, you see, can be overwhelming, can't it? But fortunately, it comes in bite-sized pieces, 24-hour segments at a time. Plan for the future, oh yes, but live now. I can't live the future, I can only live today. Life is what happens to us while we're planning something else. Today, you see, is the good old days we're going to talk about in 15 years' time, aren't we? So enjoy now. Make the most of now. Don't make the mistake of, of planning your life without God. Don't make the mistake of presuming about tomorrow. I don't know if I've got next week, much less next year. I just shouldn't, I just shouldn't assume it. Just because the future is uncertain, unsure and brief doesn't mean we get all uptight and paralysed over these sorts of things and then we worry. No, it's the motivation to trust God more. You put your trust in God, that's how you face the future. David says in Psalm 31, verse 15, my future is in your hands. So don't make the mistake of planning without God and don't make the mistake of presuming about tomorrow. Instead, include God in your planning and make the most of today. Live one day at a time. And therefore, fourthly, celebrate each moment with God. In other words, celebrate that God is always with us. One of the key fruits of trusting God is joy. Uh, unfortunately, the word trust in some Christian circles is a word that seems to sort of signify this, this lowered brow, you know, this stiff face, this determined will. <sighs> yes, Lord, I'm going to trust you. Yes, I'll just power through, I'll trust you day by day. Trusting, trusting. You know that sort of thing? It's not what the Bible sees trust as. The Hebrew word for trust carries almost the exact opposite association. It refers to an almost playful carelessness. It invites us to let go of our fears and worries and smile and celebrate that God is with us today. Psalm 118 verse 24 says, This day belongs to the Lord, let's celebrate and be glad today. Which is why the people of Israel practice their faith through celebration and song and dance and festival, and we could do a little bit of learning from that. So if you fancy dancing in the next song before the communion, go for it. I'm sensing not many of you are going to do that, but you know. And we who worry, we who have much, we therefore worry so often, don't we? 
And we need to learn that God has not invited us into this stern-faced stress, but one of a carefree, almost playful trust. Like children playing before a loving parent who is good and has promised to provide. So, here's the thing. Find a way to celebrate life this week. That's right, your pastor's just told you to go and have some fun this week. You can do that. If people think you're having too much fun this week, you can say, my pastor told me to do this, and I'm always obedient to what my pastor tells me to do. Have some fun. Celebrate life, even in the midst of worry. There's a line in the Old Testament that God's mercies aren't new every morning, which means God is faithful again tomorrow, as he is today. The verse is found in Lamentations 3.23. Here's how the NLT puts it. Great is his faithfulness. His mercies begin afresh each day. And you and I, we get to celebrate that, serve in that, listen to him, listen for him in that day, today, daily. And when it comes to your future, he has it all in his good, good hands. Jeremiah 29, 11, a well-loved verse for many of us. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. And you can trust him in that. Abraham did, and Abraham was used incredibly by God. Trust God. Live for him. And not be fearful of your future. Let's pray together. And maybe as we just quietly come before the Lord, can I encourage you to imagine the picture, that picture of your future, the one that you have in your minds, maybe the, all the details of it. Maybe that's the future that you're holding on to tightly, saying, God, that's what I want, that's what I'm working to, that's where I'm heading. Instead of imagining it, holding it tightly gripped in your hands, I want you to imagine it just with open hands. Hands upward towards God and receive these words in the light of all the fears that you have about your future. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. Father, we pray that you would help those words ring true in our hearts today. Help us to trust you with our future in practical ways today and this week. Help us hold with open hands the very things that we would cling to, the things that we worry about, knowing that you are the God who says and promises, I will. We pray this together in your name. Amen.